thousand years, emperors and generals, dictators and police, criminals, clerics, and even medical doctors have used a vast array of torture devices. These insidious instruments included the mundane and the exotic. Everything from fists and feet to elaborate machines that literally slow cooked their victims alive. Wooden crosses were favored by the ancient Romans. Various spiked metal encasements, stretching machines, and sexual devices by the medieval Europeans. Fists, beatings, and electricity by 21st century torturers. When it comes to a definition of torture and torture devices, there is little disagreement among experts. Under the UN Convention Against Torture, which was passed by the General Assembly in 1984, torture is defined as cruel, inhuman, or degrading activities against an individual uh, for the purpose of extracting information or punishment or revenge or intimidation. A torture instrument is essentially any instrument that's used to inflict forcible pain on a human being. What kind of person tortures another human being? And who among us would be inspired to create an instrument of torture and then actually use it? People often imagine that the torturer is some sort of psychopath. But in fact, torturers can be highly educated people who come out of universities, who have studied music and art and philosophy, and they can also be brutal people who come out of the prisons and are used by the state to, uh, to act as torturers. Over the past decade, the United Nations has openly denounced the use of any torture for any reason by any nation state. But what about cases like the capture of the Al-Qaeda military commander, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? a man who was one of bin Laden's closest associates and Al-Qaeda's number one strategist. Would torture be justified in an attempt to extract vital information from them about future acts of terrorism? Or to gain the names and locations of other terrorists in his vast network? For anyone that thinks that torture is actually an effective device to get quality information, that's certainly never been proven by, uh, by any experience in humankind for centuries. Torture gets people to say anything to make the pain go away. Experts tell us that the same is true when it comes to extracting confessions to a crime. Confessions extracted under torture are notoriously bad. Um, I, you know, I can get, I can get anyone to confess to anything. If you give me enough time, I, I bet you I can get you to confess to anything I want you to confess to. It's, it's just a matter of time because people have a breaking point. In fact, in early 2003, in the state of Illinois, Governor George Ryan commuted the sentences of prison inmates whose convictions were largely based on confessions extracted as a result of torture torture that included electronic shocking devices. These electronic immobilization devices, or EIDs, were originally developed in the 1970s. They were designed to be used as non-lethal restraint devices for police forces and prison guards who were dealing with dangerous criminals. They are still lawful for this purpose, but over the last 30 years, they have risen to prominence as illegal torture devices for a number of governments, military organizations, and police agencies who are trying to hide their torture activities. What a lot of the electric shock um, technology does now is it doesn't leave permanent marks. And so it enables torturers to engage in or to inflict the same kind of intense pain to accomplish their objectives so they can deny that they engaged in torture. Among the convenient electronic tools designed for one purpose, but turned into a device for mistreating humans, was the cattle prod, which first appeared in the stockyards of Buenos Aires in the early 1930s. That was nothing more than a billy club device that was initially used quite literally to prod cattle to get them to move along. It was modified then into a device to um, 
prod people. Uh, a riot control device during the riots of the 1960s where you, you saw it used against people who were marching for their rights uh, used by uh, police forces in the South against f poor black folks that, that were you know, marching t to be American citizens. A modern cattle prod delivers a mild shock at the point of physical contact by means of a low voltage electric current sent across two electrodes. Experts say this small amount of electricity does not harm cattle, but it does deliver a reasonably painful shock to the smaller human body. Stun guns are another story. A stun gun is a small, very concealable handheld device uh, that enables an individual to, uh, who is in close physical proximity to another to deliver a debilitating uh, charge of electricity to them. You actually have to physically make contact with the individual and this device uh, to generally incapacitate them. About the size of a typical flashlight, stun guns have a fairly simple design. They generate a high voltage, low amperage electrical charge the power source is ordinary 9-volt batteries that supply electricity to a circuit that includes multiple transformers. These components boost the voltage in the circuit anywhere from 80,000 volts to a high of 720,000 volts. Enough electricity to trigger a thousand garage door openers. Stun belts are basically stun guns that are attached to prisoners by means of a heavy-duty, one-size-fits-all belt. There is a remote control unit that activates this device from as far a distance as 200 to 300 feet. When it's engaged, a stun belt will administer a high-voltage charge to the inmate's kidneys. An instantaneous shock spreads throughout the entire body, and the prisoner becomes paralyzed for several minutes. The immediate effects of electric torture can include rupturing of blood vessels and tearing of, and rupturing of muscles and ligaments off the bone. The long-term effects really depends on the, on the system of the body that's affected. It's the kind of pain that causes people to urinate or defecate without control, to lose control of their muscles. Um, it's the kind of pain that causes people to have ongoing mental health problems. In some countries, these more sophisticated electronic immobilization devices are difficult to obtain. As a result, torturers will use a cheap makeshift version, a couple of high voltage batteries connected to a few cables or wires. One of the, the, the ways that torture has often been perpetrated, particularly against political dissidents, has been the use of electricity where Electrical wires have been attached to genitals or fingers or toes or a person's head using a generator or a battery or, or any sort of electrical device. Often what happens is that a person is splashed with water beforehand so that the electrical current will run easier into the body. The use of these devices to terrorize, to punish, to extract information and confessions leaves no visible trace. But the torture instruments of antiquity were not so deceptive. In the 21st century, governments claim that the practice of torture is despicable and horrifying. But for at least three millennia, torture was legal. It was a commonly used method of punishment, not only for criminals, but also for innocent slaves and foreigners. Over 3,000 years ago, the Chinese Book of Wisdom known as the I Ching spoke of a punishment called the Shi Ho in this way. Shin Ho, biting through. His neck is locked in the wooden Kong. His ears are gone. Great misfortune. This punishment required a device called the Kong. It was used for minor criminal offenses well into the 20th century. The Kong was a very large, heavy, thick wooden board with a hole cut in the middle the size of the victim's neck. This bulky device was worn for as long as 20 or 30 days, 
It was never allowed off the victim's neck. Because of the board's size, it was impossible for the victim to feed himself, making him dependent upon the kindness of others for food and drink. If he had no friends, he could die from starvation. In 1300 BC in the Mediterranean world, the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II is said to have tortured Hittite prisoners by flogging them with whips made of ox leather, weighted with bone splitters or metal hooks and spikes. His purpose was to extract information about their battle plan against Egypt and the location of their forces. The ancient Assyrians also practiced horrifying brutality, not just in warfare, but against their own dissident citizens. We have, for example, an ancient story of a village that tried to revolt against the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians rounded up the leaders of the revolt, flayed them alive, spread their skins on the city walls as a warning. We know this story from Assyrian sources. In other words, they wanted the story to be known. They wanted people to hear the horrific results of any who would oppose them. That is torture and terrorism. Nearly a thousand years later, it was the Greeks who brought their own brand of deadly ingenuity to the creation of one particular torture device, the brazen bull. This was a large copper bronze uh, statue of a bull that was hollow. And according to the legend, according to the story, you would place someone inside this device and then heat it. The heat was created by fires that were lit underneath the hollow bronze figure, making the brazen bull function like an oven. The torture victim would slowly roast, as well as suffocate from the loss of oxygen caused by the tremendous heat. Supposedly, the groans of the person suffering inside would sound like the sound of a bull, the sound of a cow. It's a horrific thought. A few centuries later, the Romans became known for using torture with a vengeance throughout their far-flung empire. One of their most used torture devices was the flogging whip, also known as the flagellum. Its thongs were made from tanned ox leather, the ends of which were weighted with lead balls. As the torturer whipped his prisoner, these lead weights cut deeply and painfully into his victim's flesh. It's the lacerations themselves that probably hurt the most in uh, whipping and caning. It's the tearing of the flesh uh, against the bone below that hurts so much. It was during the reign of Tiberius that the most famous torture victim of all time, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified. Crucifixion as a form of public execution predates the Romans. We know at least as early as the Persian Empire, some kind of public display of death that involves hanging up victims. The idea seems rather straightforward. Make a person's death as publicly horrific as possible. The purpose of this was to send a powerful message to would-be dissidents and troublemakers. Do not defy the state's authority. Hundreds of years before Jesus' torture and execution, victims of crucifixion were tied, not nailed, to a single wooden stake that was planted firmly in the ground. They were left to die from thirst or from starvation and there was always the possibility they would be attacked by hungry wild animals searching for an easy meal. In approximately 70 BC, the Romans introduced the four-pointed cross that would later become the symbol of Christianity. But long before it was used to crucify Jesus, the Roman army made extensive use of their new cross when they crushed the slave rebellion led by the gladiator Spartacus in 71 BC. 6,000 of his followers were crucified the Roman commander had their bodies hung from beams that lined the road from Capua, where the revolt began, to Rome, a distance of 270 miles. Spartacus himself was killed in the battle. When we think about who it was that Rome executed in these horrific public forum, like the crucifixion, it's clear to us. The Romans executed publicly anyone who was seen to oppose Roman power. Jesus of Nazareth was considered just such a threat. He was arrested during Passover 
quickly tried and then convicted in the local Roman court. It was then that he was subjected to a series of tortures. There's little reason to doubt the New Testament picture that Jesus began suffering long before the actual crucifixion, that Jesus was whipped, that Jesus was beaten, that he was already cut and bleeding from crowns of thorns or from the whipping, and was made exhausted to carry the device of his own death. The flogging whip used on Jesus was the lead-weighted leather flagellum. The crown of thorns that was placed on his head may have been constructed from the branches of a plant with long curved thorns called the Sisyphus spina Christi, that grows in the Jordan Valley. His final torture took place on the wooden cross. Crucifixion was designed to make death extended. That is, it was to inflict the maximum amount of pain and suffering and to make it last. Once at Golgotha, the location chosen for his crucifixion, iron spikes were driven through Jesus' wrists and feet. There was nothing in place to support his shoulders, neck, head, or the bulk of his body. As a result of this positioning, the uppermost portion of his trunk eventually would collapse over his diaphragm, making normal breathing impossible. The best guess seems to be that people die from asphyxiation, unable to exhale because of the paralysis of the pectoral and intercostal muscles. So their lungs become filled with carbon dioxide and unable to take in oxygen, and eventually they, they suffocate. The Romans continued crucifying and torturing Christians for the next 300 years. Then, ironically, the Roman Empire under Constantine embraced Christianity as its own state religion. But as the years passed, Christianity itself adopted the use of torture, sending the imaginations of inventors of torture devices to new levels of darkness. The creation of tribunals to suppress opposing viewpoints has a long tradition. Clerics, kings, and even United States senators have employed state-sponsored courts or inquisitions to root out the heretics and non-believers. In the 15th century, it was the Spanish royals, Isabella and Ferdinand, who gave what became known as the Spanish Inquisition its place in history, as a harsh and deadly exercise of combined church and state power, dedicated to torturing those citizens who it named as heretics. The state, or the secular, has always been involved in torture to some capacity. When we think about the Inquisition, we often associate it with the church but the Inquisition was really the church and state working hand in hand, often for the purposes of the state more than the church. Under the guise of establishing unity in her homeland, Queen Isabella asked for and received the Roman Catholic Pope's permission to purify her subjects. Spanish citizens of every rank and class had three choices. To accept Roman Catholicism as their religion, to leave Spain, or to risk torture at the hands of the Inquisition. It only took two adult men to identify somebody as a heretic. At that point, they could be tried. But before a trial could begin, a confession from the accused was required. That's where torture became necessary. A typical torture session during the time of the Inquisition would often involve a number of different tools that would be present. And there might be a number of other people present participating. And it's very also important to note that there'd be other victims who are both in the process of being tortured or yet to be tortured. The face of torture during the Inquisition was the Iron Maiden, manufactured in Germany. It was a man-sized container fitted on the inside with sharp metal spikes a torture device that was well known and deeply feared, not only in Spain, but in all of Europe. There was a great deal of craftsmanship, ingenuity, and knowledge of the human body to produce and design the Iron Maiden. As you open up, you'll notice that these spikes inside are placed in very strategic points intended to miss the vital organs. This was done to ensure the victim would remain alive as long as possible, all the while experiencing tremendous pain and suffering. 
While the Iron Maiden may have been the face of the Inquisition, it was generally thought that the rack was its workhorse. The rack is one of the most common forms of torture that we know um, in terms that you can use many different methods uh, in your process, in your torture creation. The first element is uh, the crank at the end. Now here is where you would tie the person's feet. You would slowly uh, add more tension to the point of you know, elongating the body. They would be rolled across these spikes um, that would be much sharper, of course, at the time. And then at this end, the uh, hands would be locked down and really leaving the victim exposed um, and often, of course, naked. And at that point, any number of things can be done. If the rack were to continue, there would be potentially ripping of tendons and ligaments and nerve damage that might be uh, chronic and go on forever. Um, people might feel uh, the inability to use their hands or the, their lower extremities. They might feel numbness, constant pain in their fingertips or toes. Ultimately, the rack was designed to slowly tear the victim's limbs out of their joints. The legs out of the hip joints, the arms out of the shoulder joints. The design of torture instruments changed as technology became more advanced. During the 1800s, a chair, completely forged of hardened metal, made its appearance. Simply called the interrogation chair, it soon became common throughout Europe. The primary function would be to sit you down. You're sitting on these spikes, which are obviously not comfortable. Um, this bar would lock down your chest. Your wrists would be held down as well. And then your legs would be clamped. Once sitting in the chair, chances are it's not going to be too long before you begin to talk. I would guess that certain people would begin to talk before they sat in the chair. I mean, it's very ominous. You wouldn't want to be here. The second major torture mechanism in the design of the chair, actually, is that it can be heated. All the metal spikes that you see uh, conduct heat. A uh, fire would be placed underneath the chair, bringing this intense, hot feeling. Thumb screws and finger screws were another highly engineered torture device. Machine tool to mechanical precision. They worked like a pair of nutcrackers. The way it would be used would be to uh, place the fingers or knuckles inside the two bars, slowly increasing pressure until the proper amount of pain was necessary to get the information that you might want from the victim. The thumb is the most important finger you have. So to actually crush the thumb makes you almost useless as a manual laborer. So it's got tremendous value in that way. It's also a very sensitive part of your body. The nerves are highly dense in the fingers, so that crushing nerves in the fingers causes significant pain. A few torture devices seem to go beyond ordinary tools of pain and suffering. Perhaps the most dreadful instrument of such debauchery was the pear. What's amazing about this piece in particular is the amount of work that went into it. It's made of bronze, it's cast, and it took a bit of ingenuity and technology, especially for the time period. Like many torture instruments, they're multifunctional. Um, in an oral capacity, it would be placed into the mouth and slowly opened for those who had uttered uh, heretical comments. Now, uh, for those who had committed homosexuality, it would be placed in the rectum. And again, slowly opened, increasing the pain. Um, in the case of women, it'd be placed in the vagina and again, slowly opened and to the point where these points would puncture the uterus. Across the Atlantic, in the New World, Native American nations had mastered the use of torture devices that were far less elaborate than the Iron Maiden or even the rack. But the basic reasons for torturing prisoners remained the same, to punish and to terrorize. In the East Coast, we do find lots of evidence of using shells to flay people alive, usually while they're tied to a stake. And oftentimes that was followed by burning or boiling the stripped flesh in front of the victim. Among the Algonquin, it was the men who would capture the victims and tie them up. But it was often left to the women to perform the actual torture. Some of the burning was akin to what was happening in Europe in terms of burning at the stake. 
uh, having a low heat fire slowly smolder under the victim's feet. Other times, the torturers would insert pieces of wood into various parts of the body and set them on fire. There's accounts of people placing them under the fingernails, in the mouth, in the ears, in the nose, anywhere where you could have a non-fatal burn, so to prolong the agony of the victim. Very often, the length of the torture itself was determined by the victim's behavior. There was honor for those who stoically accepted the pain. It's the people who cried out, who ex expressed some sort of fear. They could expect a much longer torture session before ultimately being killed. But usually, death was the ultimate result. By the mid-19th century in Europe, Great Britain, and the United States, there was a groundswell of popular sentiment against torture. In 1864, the Geneva Convention was drafted. It was an international agreement that, among other things, prohibited the use of torture. But rather than bringing the practice to an end, it would slowly drive it underground. By World War II, the practice of torture had been illegal for almost 80 years. The creators of torture devices should have been out of business. Instead, they turned to everyday appliances, items that could be found in the household or on the job. The amazing thing is, is the common devices, the things that you use in your everyday life, things that you find at home that become suddenly violent, sick devices of torture. A fork can be used to, to, to hold somebody's finger in place, to hold somebody's pinky in place, to, to stab somebody. Um, the same with the, you know, the pliers. I mean, again, they're so simple, and yet they can create such agony. All of these things were used as torture devices by the Nazis, by the Gestapo. A famous French-born British spy named Odette was arrested by the Gestapo in Marseille in 1943. When she refused to answer her interrogator's questions about the French underground and the British-supported spy network operating in Vichy, France, Odette's torture began. They took her to an interrogation room and they used a red-hot poker and they touched it to her third or fourth lumbar on her spine and just held it there, burning her skin um, for, for up, up to minutes. Um, and they pulled her fingernails out very slowly, fingers and toenails, one at a time, with pliers. In spite of the wretched pain and heavy discharge of blood, Odette refused to give up her comrades, who she knew faced certain death. Even though she was herself sentenced to death, Odette somehow turned up in a concentration camp for women and survived the war. Most Gestapo torture victims knew they were being tortured because they had verbal secrets their torturers wanted. But a small group of victims at Auschwitz concentration camp had no idea that they were being tortured because they had medical secrets locked away in their bodies. The notorious Dr. Josef Mengele tortured his victims in the name of science. The devices he employed were the common tools of a physician. Scalpels, forceps, and surgical scissors. Really, he's remembered for his grotesque and vicious torture on the inmates, um, particularly twins, identical as opposed to fraternal. He would then perform various experiments. Some involved injecting different chemicals into the body of one twin and not the other and see how they react. Um, he also wanted to get, take tissue samples um, from the major organs. And this was often done, you know, in the most brutal way. One of Mengele's most horrifying tortures was placing some twins into a vat of near boiling water for a period of time and then strapping them onto a table so that the softened tissue samples could be more easily sliced away without the benefit of anesthesia. There were 125 sets of twins in Auschwitz in 1944. By the end of the year, only a dozen or so survived. This is how monstrous a man, the, the experiments and all of these things that he performed, this is his legacy, really. And of course, he's never caught. I mean, he got away. Mengele vanished in 1945 when Allied forces liberated the camps. Despite international efforts to track him down, he was never apprehended. <laughs> 
a 68-year-old man who died in Brazil in 1979, was later identified through DNA as Mengele. In the Pacific during World War II, wherever the Imperial Japanese forces were victorious, the people of that nation were often tortured. It made no difference if the victims were civilians or military POWs. The most common instruments of punishment were the canes and whips they used to flog their prisoners. Some POWs were hung upside down by their feet, while urine or iodine was poured directly into their nostrils or down their throats. In January 1942, when the Japanese invaded the American-held Philippine Islands, American civilian expatriates were arrested and imprisoned. The first civilian the Japanese took into custody was a middle-aged, stubborn Kentuckian who had been slightly crippled from polio. His name was Roy Bennett, a respected journalist who had refused to stop criticizing the Japanese government's violent empire building. His wife and two daughters were also arrested and placed in the Santo Tomas internment camp in Manila. He had been the editor of the Manila Daily Bulletin, which was the most influential English language newspaper in the Far East. And he, as an influential person, saying negative things against the Japanese. And he was very harsh, very loud, prior to their coming in. Bennett was incarcerated in Fort Santiago, an ancient dreary prison reserved for civilian political prisoners. It had been a fortress built by the Spanish when they were in charge of the Philippines, when they owned the Philippine Islands. And it was exactly what you would think of as a Spanish dungeon and fortress. Bennett's Japanese captors wanted to use him as a propaganda tool, to torture him into admitting he had been gravely misguided when he spoke out against the Japanese government. One of the tortures that was used on many of the political prisoners was inserting a bamboo sliver deep under the fingernail and then lighting it. But probably the most common physical torture was simply beating them. The beatings were administered by just about anything at hand, including their hands. They would use clubs, bamboo canes, the flat side of a bayonet, uh, just anything that they could use to inflict great pain. As Bennett and other civilian, political, and military prisoners suffered, the Japanese were also torturing Filipinos who remained loyal to the Americans. It was not uncommon for a Japanese soldier to take a baby from its mother's arms, from its Filipino mother's arms, throw it in the air, and catch it on the bayonet. It was not uncommon for the soldiers to rape the women to execute or torture a Filipino man in front of his family, or to torture the Filipino wife and children in front of the man. On February 3rd, 1945, Roy Bennett and his family were among the prisoners liberated by the American forces. Two weeks later, they returned to the United States. The torture really never ends. It is always with the person who's been tortured. Um, they relive it all the time. They have to decide why it is that they lived and others died. The screams are as real to them 20 years after the fact as they were when it was happening to them. According to his family, Roy Bennett carried the psychological scars of his torture until his death in 1967. 35 years later, and 3,000 miles southwest by way of the South China Sea, a gruesome discovery was made. It was in Cambodia in 1978 that the invading Vietnamese army found Pol Pot's secret prison. He called it S-21. It was used as a secure location to torture Cambodian prisoners he believed were counter-revolutionaries. This was a secret place because the whole business of what the government was doing uh, was kept a secret for most of the people in the country most of the time, particularly as it involved torturing and killing uh, people who were accused of being enemies of the state. A prison archive was meticulously maintained. Within its pages are entries that reveal appalling acts of torture carried out against its inmate population. What you have here is an interrogator's uh, appendix to a uh, 
uh, a confession. In other words, it's a rare kind of document. You get very few of these documents where an interrogator tells you what he did in various in, in, in sequence. On the um, morning of the 18th of August, 1977, I decided, this is the interrogator speaking, I decided to employ torture. I watched his morale fall while I administered torture, but he had no reaction. In the afternoon of the 21st, uh, another day later, I pressured him again using the electric cord. He's given two or three spoonfuls of, of to eat. That would be human excrement. And after that, he was able to answer questions, uh, etc. That night, I beat him again with the electric cord. Uh, it's an incredible quotation, as you, as you see. Besides being forced to eat feces, prisoners also were forced to drink urine, were subjected to electric shocks, and suffocation with a plastic bag. One of the many clients that I have worked with from Cambodia, he had a plastic bag put over his head uh, during the course of an interrogation session. It was put over his head, they would ask him a question, he would not answer, they would put it over his head and he would nearly suffocate. They would take it off briefly, interrogate him some more, put the bag over his head. The consequence of being in a bag is asphyxiation. The person who's asphyxiated loses consciousness. They may lose consciousness and come back to, and the torture continues. There may be a cycle of asphyxiation, losing consciousness, and coming back for more torture. They also have the possibility of being asphyxiated so badly that they die. The long-term consequences of asphyxiation would most likely include brain damage. In 1984, four years after the discovery of the horror of Pol Pot's secret prison, the United Nations General Assembly passed the UN Convention Against Torture. Even so, today the worldwide use of torture and torture devices continues to spin dangerously out of control. Experts tell us that torture and the use of torture devices is currently a worldwide epidemic. According to Amnesty International, 75% of the world's governments have employed torture since the beginning of the new millennium. Electronic shocking devices, beatings, and psychological abuse top the list. And there is an ever-increasing array of ordinary objects that are not technology-driven, but that are used as instruments of torture simply because they are available. Among the most disturbing may be sexual torture. Vaginal penetration, sodomization. Uh, men and women are, are subjected to rape as a form of torture. A famous example of that is the Coke bottle. Coca-Cola bottles were used in Latin America to be inserted in victims' anuses. Why? Because when the person was let go from the prison, the Coca-Cola bottle is ubiquitous. They could not go anywhere without seeing it and therefore being reminded of their torture. The most accessible contemporary torture devices are fists, feet, whips, and canes. It may be for this reason that beatings are among the most common form of torture in the world today, especially where there is religious persecution in countries like Egypt, Pakistan, the Sudan, and China. One famous form of torture that occurred for a long time and still occurs uh, throughout the world is falanga, which is the beating on the soles of the feet with a blunt object like a cane. What happens short term is tremendous pain and bleeding in the bottoms of the feet. But after that heals, for months and even years afterwards, the torture survivor has pain just walking on their feet. Beatings are sometimes accompanied with degrading acts of obscenity. A somewhat typical incident involved three Ethiopian women. First of all, they were stripped of their clothing. They were hung upside down by a pole, just an ordinary pole. Uh, and then they were whipped with cords. When they screamed, they would have socks put in their mouths. Sometimes they would be bloody socks, sometimes vomit-filled socks. And this is a very typical form of torture. In my experience, there are a wide range of implements and other objects that have been used to torture individuals. To name a few, iron bars, sometimes that are heated up and applied to the body, cigarette butts, uh, batons are quite common, rifle butts. I've had clients who have been, uh, their bodies have been pressed against hot burning radiators. Often the key to the successful use of a torture device is the torturer's skill in keeping his victim alive. 
persons who have been tortured, certainly those who are being tortured for political purposes, are sent out into the community as symbols of what will happen to others if they continue to be in opposition. You need to be alive for that. And you need for the community to see you as a broken person. The use of torture devices remains a shadowy business. While civilization's enemies may be arrested and tortured, legions of innocents are left to suffer the same fate, sometimes for years on end. With the threat of violence on the increase, it is likely the use of torture devices will increase as well. Ultimately, what people can really do to help resolve the issue of torture in our world is to gain a new understanding of it, to accept that it exists, and to become educated. Um, because it's real, and the more educated we are about it, the more likely we are to do what we can to resolve it. This is a dark side of our humanity that we need to deal with and better understand. There are always going to be surprises. You don't have to speak the language to be able to interact with people. Knowing that can make you look at history in a new and